Shaitan Rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum dear viewers and welcome to this show on Imam Hussain TV where we'll be examining lessons from the life of the great lady Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, daughter of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. And inshallah over the next few episodes we'll be examining various aspects of her life and looking at how we can take those lessons on board in our own lives. One of the main lessons that we can take uh, from Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, and in particular from her marriage to her husband uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, uh, is the lesson of the absolutely perfect marriage. So today marriage is uh, an issue uh, of unfortunate contention in the West and also in our communities where divorce rates have never been higher uh, and many people uh, across uh, this side of the earth are facing uh, issues in their marriage. But inshallah, hopefully in this episode what we can do is look at what Fatima Zahra alayhi salam taught us in terms of being uh, the exemplar wife uh, and how we can take those lessons on board in our own marriages and ensure uh, that we ensure that we, much like uh, Fatima Zahra alayhi salam and our husband, uh, achieve marital bliss. Inshallah, to explore this topic, I'm honored to be joined today uh, by my dear guest, Sheikh Mohammed Al Hili. Salam alaikum, Sheikh. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Of honor. course, uh, I think we're well aware of the fact that the marriage uh, between uh, Fatima Zahra alayhi salam and uh, Imam Ali uh, was one that was absolutely. Uh, powerful uh, and there are many many stories that we've heard over the years going to Majalis and the different programs uh, just about uh, what lessons we can take on board uh, from this marriage but just to give us a brief introduction can you tell us why uh, the household of Ali and Fatima in particular are exemplary what about that marriage uh, is so special one might ask Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammadin wa ala ahli bayti al-tayibin al-tahirin I guess one of the things I was reflecting on is how the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala is so kind and merciful in that every concept and every idea in our lives He has given us and set an example for us to emulate and look to. So in the teachings of the religion of Islam we have the idea of the theory, the instructions that we are somehow given to follow. but a, a tremendously powerful extension of this is exemplars who actually took this on board and mm. applied it into their own lives. And this is very key for human beings because we like to emulate, we like to look for, yeah. look to individuals and we say, okay, how did they live their lives? We seek our Let own see how they um, dealt with co uh, problems or challenges. And that's why I think when we discuss the wonderful household of Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib and Sayyidat al Nisa Fatima al Zahra, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhima, um, there are, you know, so many areas that we can reflect on. And some people I know now in the 21st century, uh, perhaps living in the Western world, will say, well, there are two concerns I have in this discussion at the outset. Number one, these are individuals who lived 1400 years ago. Mm. They're not really some people I can relate to now. We have mm. different challenges now. A marital life and a family set up, as you said, is going through so many challenges now. Mm. And the second thing is they'll say they're ma'asum. Mm. You know, um, they're perfect in, in that sense. So how can I, as a mortal human being, as a fallible human being, look at an individual who's error-free, who's sinless, and somehow learn from them? The answer to this is, number one, uh, the, the the examples of the Ahl al-Bayt are ones that are for all times. This is what makes them unique because they're set, they're here for guidance of all human beings, not for their time only because people around their time didn't really as much evaluate or really benefit from them as much as they could have. And the Quran says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You have in the Holy Prophet of Islam the best example. And when Allah says you have the best example, the Quran doesn't limit this to the people in the 7th century Arabia mm. or those who used to live there. This is for all times. So the Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt are certainly not time specific. They're there for all the time. And so being a ma'asum is necessary for the delivering of God's instructions and guidance and message uh, so that when we receive it from them, we know it's pristine, it's pure. Um, we can know that definitely something we should follow. But at the same time, when you examine the life of uh, the Holy Lady, peace and blessings be upon her, Sayyidatul Nisa Fatima, according to our tradition, she only lived for 18 years. Mm. Now imagine, 18 years, and she got married at nine, so that means her marital life was only nine years. Mm. And 
it's incredible when you sit for a moment and think that you know today we have people living 50 60 70 80 years and yes they leave a particular legacy or a few pointers or they discover something but what a gem Lady Fatima was mm. that, you know, 18 years of age she left this world. Yet we can sit and discuss for hours and hours exemplary uh, um, lessons from her life. Now, it's not me or anyone else coming and saying, well, we love Ali ibn Abi Talib, we love Fatima to Zahra. And their marriage was something of a, a great uh, um, setup. So let's look from them. It's the Quran. Mm. Quran tells us the household of Imam Ali and Fatima to Zahra is amongst the best households. Someone mm. will ask where? Chapter 24, Surah An-Nur, verse 36. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the verse before 35 says, Allah nurus samawati wal ard. Allah is the illuminating light of the heavens and the earth. Of course, this light is not physical light. This light is a light of guidance, is the light that brings about existence and sustains existence. But the next verse says, Fi buyutin adhin Allahu an turfa. The light is found in certain households that He, subhanahu wa ta'ala, has allowed for these, for, for these particular households to be raised, raised either physically, we use this verse to prove the legitimacy of building shrines, mm. but also raised in the minds of people, respected and revered in the minds of people. Um, and so in many traditions, uh, for example, Allah Mahafad Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti in the Dur al-Manthur, he is one of the scholars of Ahl sunnah he narrates that one of the companions of the Prophet said, Ya Rasulullah, okay, we want to find this light, where do we look for it? I mean, you know, Allah says it's, it's in certain households. And so the Prophet of Islam says, Fi buyut al-Anbiya, mm. it is in the households of Prophets. Mm. And so another person asks the Prophet, Abaytu Ali and wa Fatima ahaduhuma or minhuma? Hmm. It's the household of Ali and Fatima. One of these amazing households which is enriched with the light of God. Hmm. The Prophet answers emphatically. Hmm. And that answer from the Prophet is sufficient. Hmm. Bel min afdalihima. Yes, the Prophet says, indeed, but it's amongst the best. Hmm you can find the light of God. Mm. So when you have this wonderful uh, illuminating household, we can learn so much from it. And of course, the Quran praises them in Ayatul Tathir, in the story of Mubahala, in numerous verses highlighting their relationship. And we can look at that. But it is sufficient for us to realize that it's not something that we can ignore. We have to look at that example and every little bit of detail we have to apply. I think what's very interesting is you mentioned, um, you know, we're speaking about the, 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 the uh, idea of a perfect marriage and, and using uh, the marriage of Ali and Fatima uh, to, 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 to show us what the perfect marriage is. Uh, and you also mentioned that um, this idea that God's light existed uh, within the household. So my question to you is, in regards to the marriage of a Muslim uh, married couple, um, marriages in our communities, what role does God consciousness play uh, in, 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 in ensuring that that marriage is a, is a perfect marriage or trying to be a perfect marriage? I think it's probably the most important factor. Mm. Um, what is interesting, and before I forget this point, because yeah. I wanted to mention it earlier, was the idea that the perfection of the household of Ali and Fatima, peace be upon them, is in relation to their character, not in relation to what they faced. There's a difference, you okay. see. Because they faced tremendous trials and tribulations. They faced hardship after hardship, difficulty after difficulty. You know, many people don't know, but the first few years of marriage in Medina was plagued with poverty. Mm. They would not have food for a number of days. Mm. So when somebody today says, yeah, but they're ma'asum. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests the ma'asumin more than he tests you and I mm. and other human beings. And that would entail that, look, you know, they're going through hardship. And the fact that they're ma'asum doesn't mean that they're not going through pain and suffering. You know, mm -hmm. some people say, okay, does ma'asum means they're somehow immune from form of uh, a hardship? No, they go through it. They feel the pain. They understand the difficulty. In today's setups, I think there is a lack of spirituality in the marital setups. Many a times we see that because people are very much consumed with materialism and the need to possess mm. and the I want culture is all there. Mm. So it's reflective when we see uh, people looking to get married and the huge costs in wedding uh, ceremonies 
even I Almost often say put it, people off sometimes. it puts mm. some of our youngsters off because some of the requirements is that you need to have a car, you need to have a house, you need to have an amazing job, you mm. need to have a savings, you mm. have to have this and the other. I need to have, well, you know, some of our ladies I've spoken to who are looking to get married, they say, you know, it's once in a lifetime. I need to have <laughs> this uh, wonderful, amazing occasion. And, you know, by the way, today in the United Kingdom, it's been shown that an, on average, uh, a wedding costs thirty thousand mm. pounds. Now, this might be quite difficult for, for example, a university student or someone who's just graduated with a huge burden of loans mm. to be able to afford something like this, um, just because there's high expectations. Oh well, someone else did it, and if I don't do it in a very lavish place, everyone will say, "Oh, this is not a great wedding." Mm. So I'll be the talking. Of, of, of the people. There's a whole culture of trying to please people uh, with, regard, with regards to your marriage. It's, what you're saying. it's all about, you know, meeting the standards that society sets mm. rather than what pleases Allah. And I think uh, there's two very important areas here that we learn from the life of Imam Ali and Sayyidah Fatima. First is spirituality. So in my humble opinion, having studied their lives as much as possible, and I've written a section of a book on marriage on the lives of Imam Ali and Sayyidah Fatima book is coming up very soon inshallah, inshallah. Um, is the absolute most spectacular most powerful quality of Sayyidah Fatima and Imam Ali in their marital setups is their servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm. and the fact that they had this connection to uh, the only beloved Allah wa ta'ala mm. so when Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam and Imam Ali are asked by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to evaluate the other Sayyidah Fatima is asked, she replies, Ni'mal Ba'al, he's the best husband. But in which way? Imam Ali salam then quantifies it when he's asked about his beloved wife, Sayyidah Nisa, the Lady of Light. The Prophet asks her and she replies, he replies, Ni'mal Awnu Ala Ta'atillah, that Fatima is the best aid, support, and assistance in the goal mm. of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Amir al Mu'mineen summarizes Fatima in this wonderful line that if I was looking for the best individual to help me in my goal in life to be the best Abdullah, the servant of God, then I have Fatima. Mm. Yes. So in that sense, you find that that somehow drew up all their lives. It puts everything in place. So with regards to materialism, simplicity was a hallmark of the household of Ali and Fatima. Mm. Salam Allah alayhi. In the idea that in their setup, they were not looking for pompous, extravagant, lavish lifestyle. In any way, shape and possible, their generosity spoke very clearly of their determination to serve Allah. And of course, we have many examples of this. But in their lives, generally, they limited themselves to simple aspects that they need in their marriage and even the dowry. Mm. We are told, of course, that Amir al-Mu'mineen had his shield. Mm. And the Prophet of Islam said, sell, sell that shield for 80 or 500. And, you know, that was used to buy a kind of a, a small mattress, you know, just basic necessities for the house of Fatima. Mm. I think it was very interesting. We speak about the idea of being God conscious uh, in marriage. Uh, and it's almost as if... Uh, what that does uh, in your relationship is make sure that you put something greater than yourself before yourself and I'm sure that you know very well when and um, when speaking about uh, when looking at the, the the issues that marital couples uh, face a lot of the time it's because uh, one side uh, of the marriage always seeks to put themselves before their partner and I think that's a great lesson in the fact that you know selflessness is how you push a marriage forward selflessness and understanding mm -hmm. uh, and I think um, one thing that one aspect of their marriage is also very interesting uh, is how the marriage uh, uh, started and, and, and came about um, so can we just go back a bit before we uh, go straight into their marriage uh, to that period of time uh, and what we uh, can learn from that uh, how they met and how they and how they began their marriage of course, uh, there were many proposals for Sayyidah Fatima salam. Some prominent individuals, people who considered themselves companions of the Holy Prophet, they emerged and they recognized that uh, Sayyidah Fatima salam was unique. She's unique in every aspect possible. Here we have a lady as described by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam as one of the four chief women of paradise. 
course, also described as Sayyidah Tunisa al Alami. Mm. And so, who wouldn't want to be um, with such an individual and under the kind of protection of Allah, under the guidance of the Holy Prophet? But what was interesting is that the Prophet of Islam would r refuse all of them. Why, he would say? I am waiting for the command of Allah. Mm. I'm waiting for that direction from the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why we are told when Sayyidah Fatima and Amir al-Mu'mineen, they married, peace and blessings be upon them, the celebrations in the heavens were greater than the celebrations on the earth, despite mm, the fact that Allah. in Medina, the celebrations were wonderful. The Prophet of Islam gave food to the poor and the needy, and of course, people were jubilant and, and delighted. Mm. But we are told in in Jannah or in the heavens, uh, uh, trees like the Shajara of Tuba in one narration, it started to sprinkle all kinds of uh, ruby and diamonds and all kinds of precious uh, uh, substances and material onto the Malaika in celebration of this wonderful occasion. And of course, the way um, the marriage was somehow uh, agreed is that Amir al Mu'mineen comes forward and proposes. But the Prophet of Islam, when he goes and seeks his daughter's um, permission. And this is reflective of Akhlaq al Anbiya and the Ibad, uh, the servants of Allah, and those who consider themselves uh, chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you look, look at Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands him in his dream to slaughter his son. Mm. And he knows it's a command. Mm. Because when he comes to his son, he says to him, I have been told to slaughter you. Mm. But if you imagine now, if we have a higher authority, which is Ma'asum, which mm. comes to you and says, that you know you have to do such a thing with a particular individual. Mm. What it, what is wonderful about this is that you know the Prophet, despite being commanded by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, asks Fatima mm. salam Allahi alayha. And of course, we are told in narrations that Sayyida Fatima, uh, due to this kind of slight embarrassment, she would just put her head down and not say anything. Mm. And uh, you know the Prophet would say that her silence is her approval, mm. and this was common at that time. Mm. You know because people would speak out if they didn't want to. Mm. And it was something that was uh, delightful for the Holy Lady of Light. Mm. But inshallah in a future episode, we'll just mention this, but I'll just, uh, we'll talk about it in detail. But just to highlight that today when we read literature, we will find that at that moment, uh, there are some unfortunately Muslim books of non-Shia origin. They say that Sayyidah Fatima was not very happy, mm. that she was rebuked by people. Oh, look, at you're marrying someone who's poor. Mm. You can get so much better. And she came to the Prophet and complained about mm. that. And it's totally unacceptable. It's mm. not something that we, in any shape or form, uh, uh, are willing to somehow accommodate. The reason being is that their life together spoke of the wonderful bond and strong relationship and their praise of each other. Mm. And uh, remember that Lady Fatima, sallallahu alayha, is the life that brought together Imam and Prophethood. Mm. And the Imma alayhum salam would come forward and say, Nahnu hujjatullah wa Fatima hujjatun alayna. Mm. Fatima is the proof of Allah on this earth. So this marriage is a marriage made in the heavens. It cannot be something that Sayyidah Fatima is not happy or displeased mm. with. I think, you know, we're very well aware that despite the fact that they're married for such a short time, uh, nine years, uh, there are a plethora of lessons we can take uh, from their marriage into our own lives. Uh, and I know time is quite limited, but um, if you can walk us through perhaps some of the most important lessons that we should take on uh, uh, from their marriage uh, today in the 21st century in our own marriages. Yes, um, I think having examined and dealing with a few cases on a regular, perhaps daily basis when I see couples and mm. I discuss with them some of the challenges they're going through or when marriages have unfortunately broken down due to a number of reasons. So you're in a very interesting position because you're seeing exactly what's happening with marriages. And yes, yes. I mean, there's case after case, you know, situation after situation. And sometimes, obviously, Alhamdulillah, I deal with people from different backgrounds. Mm. So not necessarily from one ethnicity or, or uh, for example, uh, age groups also differ. You yeah. know, people who are older or younger when they're married as well. And you see a common pattern in, in, in some of the challenges that couples face as well. I think it is safe to say that one of the common reasons or one of the things I'm not seeing as much as perhaps my eldest saw is patience. Mm. 
in the sense that today there are uh, situations where either the husband and wife feels the need to walk out or give up quite quickly mm. and are not willing to look for solutions as much. Uh, of course, there are other, uh, other considerations and factors. I'm not dismissing or making it as simple as that. But one important lesson that I find from the illustrious life of uh, Holy Lady Fatima alayhi salam and Imam Ali alayhi salam is the sabr that they exhibited throughout the nine years. Um, whether it was difficulty, whether it was at ease, um, at times, you know, we have narrations that Imam Ali alayhi salam comes to the house and finds that Sayyida Fatima had not had food with Imam al Hassan al Hussein for three days. Mm. And he finds them pale. Mm. And he says, and he was away. And he says, okay, but why didn't you send a message? Why didn't you say? And Sayyida Fatima responds and says, my father has taught me that I should not burden my husband with anything that I know he cannot provide. Mm. At that moment, maybe she recognized that Imam Ali salam would not be able to provide the food mm. and so they remained patient um, recognizing that it is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reward them for and he, and he sometimes viewed the sabr as a negative thing because mm. it's sometimes viewed as something that people have to go through pain and suffering whereas in reality is empowerment the reality is stretches our muscle of not only tolerance, but the ability to deal with challenges in life. The more we are patient, the more we can be uh, uh, progressive and, and develop in our lives. The other important area perhaps that me, we may need to look at, and, and, and I think it was so key in the wonderful life of these holy individuals, is servitude to others. Mm. And there are so many examples in the Quran mm. That's about very interesting. Imam Ali mm. and Sayyidina Fatima alayhi salam. So many times, uh, there is a feeling in marriage that it's about the husband and the wife. Mm. Let's look after ourselves. Mm. Let's ensure that our family is well fed, they're comfortable, nice accommodation, nice job. As long as we're happy, everything will be fine. Ali and Fatima shattered this belief. Mm. What they sought to establish in society is you want a happy marriage? You want a successful marital relationship? Serve others in the mm. cause of God for the sake of Allah. And of course, Surah Al-Insan speaks about this brilliantly. The idea that these two holy individuals, having observed the fast for three days and encouraging or somehow setting a wonderful example for their children and Lady Fidda Sallallahu Alaihi and the household to do the same, they would be looking at the welfare of others. They gave the food due to the love of Allah uh, the, on three consecutive days to the poor, to the yatim, the orphan, and the captive. And the captive, of course, probably most likely was not a Muslim mm. because at that time there were no Muslims who were captives. Mm. It has to be a non-Muslim. Mm. Okay? And they did not differentiate. They gave the food. And it's interesting, in chapter 59, verse number 9, there's another story. Another story in which the Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is visited by a poor individual who says, I need some food. I'm a stranger here. I need help. The Prophet asks his wives, uh, someone to say to his wives, do you have any food at home? They said, no. He says, go to the house of Ali and Fatima. Mm. Subhanallah. The Prophet knows the house of generosity, the house mm. of magnanimity, the house of beauty. So this man comes to the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen welcomes him and says, yes, we'll provide you with food. But the narrations tell us that they did not have enough food because they had not eaten themselves mm. and the children had not eaten. Mm. And so they defer to and Imam Ali alayhi salam because they have this goal in life, which is to serve others. And they know that will strengthen the marriage. They said, it's fine. We'll make sure the children sleep without food and we will make sure that the food is eaten only by that individual. Mm and not shared by anyone else. Mm. And in order for that to happen, Sayyidina Fatima suggests to Amir al-Mu'mineen that you have a lamp, a candle, blow this candle off mm. so that it's dark, present the food in front of the person so he can see it, and he will eat only by himself, and he will not see that you're not eating, because mm. if you have the candle, he will ask you to eat. Mm. But we want him to be satisfied mm. only, mm. so that in case the food is not enough, which probably wasn't for mm. two people, it's sufficient for one person. Mm. 
And it's amazing, subhanAllah, the extent of the love for other human beings characterized in their life was seen in this story. And the next day or later when the Prophet sees Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this part of the verse, وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا They are favoring others over themselves even though they need it most. Mm -hmm. And I feel that that is something that we seem to sometimes lack in our day-to-day -day setups. And that's why a recommendation that I have for the couples to make it more practical is do something for the sake of Allah together. Mm. Serve the community, either, for example, teaching at the madrasa, mm. for example, or volunteering in a charity or mm. the local mosque or Husseiniya mm. or any form of setup mm. yes, together. Um, sponsor an orphan together. Mm. Yeah, look for some initiative where you can help each other seek proximity to Allah through ihsan, mm. through doing good. Mm. I think it's very interesting because, especially in this day and age, uh, serving others is something that's very, very easy to do. You know, mm. any couple can uh, make sure that they give their Saturday afternoon or whenever it is to go down to a local soup kitchen uh, to help feed the poor, homeless. You know, or even uh, you know help clothe the homeless or, or whatever it is. It, it, it's something that, subhanAllah, you know, you mentioned uh, people ask, how is it that a marriage uh, over a thousand years ago can help us today? Uh, but that lesson is something we can so easily take on board today uh, in the West, given that there are so many initiatives to take part in. Uh, together. Yes. Um, you mentioned that there are some more lessons as well. Yeah. Um, can you give us the next lesson? Uh, yes, sure. There are um, a new, a numerous um, uh, instances where Imam Ali alayhi salam is seen to be helping Sayyidah Fatima at home. Mm. And I reflect on this and, and think, okay, 1400 years ago, yeah. the idea of men doing housework. Yeah, very misogynist society. Very. Mm. You know, where women before Islam were being um, inherited, girls were being buried alive, um, women had virtually no rights. And now we have men doing housework. Mm. Islam came with tremendous reforms and wanted to awaken uh, society to what is right. Mm. And so these were demonstrated by these holy individuals. The Holy Prophet وسلم, numerous narrations told that he came, he saw Amir al Mu'mineen sieving the pulses, you know, sweeping the floor. And in those instances, in, uh, the Holy Prophet would praise this act. He would talk about how those individuals, men, who come and help their wives in the household chores, for example, uh, will be rewarded more than, for example, the reward given to Asiya, uh, the wife of Fir'aun, due to her patience, for example, and so on. And talks about the rivers and the gardens that they would get in Jannah and so on. Mutual cooperation in the household was an example in the marital life of Sayyidah Fatima and Amir al peace and blessings be upon them. The other area which I find is key is Today, we have one of the biggest challenges that uh, husband and wife or parents are having is the correct upbringing of children. Mm. And I think people are struggling. When they struggle, they say, well, you know what? My child doesn't want to pray. My daughter doesn't want to wear hijab. My son, God forbid, is into drugs. My daughter is surrounded with the wrong crowd, for example. Um, they don't listen. We tell them, but they don't listen. They don't want to come to mosque. They don't want to come to Husseiniyah. They don't want to come to Majalis. They're not interested. They're on their phones all the time. Mm. Uh, they're on social media and so on. The complaints that people are getting. Similarly, we have other challenges like, for example, the rise of the LGBTQ movement, the RSE. These things are there. And so parents, it's a struggle. And you need a lot of help. What I say to parents often when I sit with them is, look, it all starts with you. Someone once said beautifully, he said to someone else, he said, how do I make my kids love Salah? Mm. How do I make them really interested in Salah? And so the response was, how do you make yourself love Salah? Mm. Very true. How do you make yourself interested in Salah? Mm. Because definitely the most powerful tool in tarbiyah and correct upbringing of children is 
obeying their role model mm. Lead and by leading example. by example mm. yes because they learn much more through actions than words mm. you may tell them don't lie don't lie don't lie but if they see you lying <laughs> if they see you having a conversation with your wife for example and they hear that you're not saying the truth or deceiving or concealing something mm. that is a bigger lesson for them mm. because then they are confused you're telling me not to lie but you're lying yourself so which one shall I actually do? Mm. And what is so characteristic in the life of Sayyidah Fatima and Amir al-Mu'min sallallahu alayhi wa is that they definitely led by example. There were wonderful examples for Imam al-Hassan al-Hussein, Sayyidah Zainab and Umm Kulthum, their children. So for example, uh, just from the illustrious life, we are told of the famous story of Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam praying Salatul Layl. And when she would pray Salatul Layl, she would recite this dua for the neighbors and others in society. Mm. And when she would finish, her son Imam al-Hassan would say, well, how come you prayed for them before you prayed for us? Mm. And she would say, Ya bunay al-jar thum dar mm. Oh my son, we pray for others before we pray out for ourselves. And similarly, the story of giving the food for the poor and the needy, they led by examples, their children were inspired by mm. this too. And so on. So it is so important that you know, as parents, we recognize that it's not about um, just constantly telling our children what to do. It's about making it happen in our own lives. It's about ensuring that we understand religion. We appreciate what we're doing to be correct and we love what we're doing. Mm. And in that, they will see if I pray on time, mm. if I watch something on TV and it's haram comes up and switch it off or turn the page, uh, turn the channel quickly, mm. they will do the same mm. because they will learn. And by the way, this happens from a really young age. Mm. It's not when they are 10 or 11. Yeah. It's when they are one or two. Mm. They can they can pick up these pick up things like a sponge. Very much. Mm. They can really work out uh, what they should be uh, doing and what they can't, shouldn't be doing in that particular way. And th then if they do what their parents don't do, they'll feel their conscience telling them that this is not right mm. because they're somehow left out in the household. Of course, this is one area. There are other things in parenting and, and, and tools within teachings of uh, religion of Islam that can be incorporated but I always say it has to start with the parents mm. and how they conduct themselves in the household and with others mm. in society mm. and I'll just say one, one, one point with this regard I often say to parents when you have conversations in front of your children what are you talking about mm. because if you're talking about you know what I have a lot of loan I don't know how to get this sorted or how we're going to deal with my parents you know they're annoying or for example how do i how do i get more money yeah. how do i buy this car yeah all that they're hearing is money materialism other people are bad mm. when you're having conversations and you say how do i get close to allah how do i get my salah better how do i make sure i attend majalis more how do i get close to ahlul bayt mm. they're saying that is important because mm, they're raised now thinking the, what is making an individual successful, what is the hallmarks for a, a successful individual is money mm. and wealth and, you know, fame mm. and, and, and somehow dealing with the challenges that society throws at you. Whereas if the conversations at home are led towards how to be closer to Allah or how to become better believers, and that sets the framework and their mindset to a much better mm. objective. Mm. Hassan Sheikh. Well, we're coming to the end of the show now, uh, and you took us on a journey through uh, the lessons that we should learn from the marriage of uh, these two uh, saints, starting with uh, their God consciousness, uh, going towards uh, the way they met and, and, and how the marriage came about, uh, and leading on to a few more lessons. Um, what kind of like final parting advice mm. uh, would you give uh, to married couples who are seeking to better their marriage by learning from these two great individuals? Yes, I think when I reflect upon um, this blessed relationship, which is oozing with uh, great morals and light that we can be inspired, I find that Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi and Sayyidah Fatima had genuine love for each mm. other. And the religion of Islam is the religion of love. Often people, when they speak about other religions like Christianity, perhaps they associate love more mm. with those religions. Whereas Imam Sadiq wasalam, who was, was asked by somebody that, I pray, I fast, but I don't do much more. But I love Allah and I loved Allah's chosen servants. And the Imam replies back by saying, 
وما الدين الا الحب از ان ريليجن اذر ذان لاف يو دو سمثينج اميزينج ميز هولد اون تو ذس رايت اند القران كمز فورد اند سيز قل ان كنتم تحبون الله فاتبعوني يحببكم الله if you want to if you claiming that you love Allah then you have to follow the messenger of God so that Allah will reciprocate and actually love you mm. when i look at this wonderful relationship i see that for example in her will of sayyida fatima she was speaking to imam ali um, and imam ali said to her instruct me to do anything you wish because you certainly will find me devoted and I will execute everything that you command me to do. I shall also put your matters over mine. Mm. That's in the wonderful conversation that happened between them. Look mm. at the reply of Sayyida. She says, may Allah reward you with the best of goodness. And then she says, you know, you are an individual that I have never ever disobeyed mm. and I have never ever made you angry. Mm. And then you know she gives him a, a, a number of um, uh, you know re- recommendations she wanted for example him to bury her at night and to make sure certain individuals would not attend her burial and to marry umama after her and mm-hmm. so on genuine love in a marital relationship will have to develop over time but it comes with sacrifice and comes with understanding each other mm-hmm comes from recognizing that males and females are different and the way they'd like to receive love is different too so a female's perception of how she should be loved is different to how males understanding expectation of how she should be loved mm. many times challenges we, we see in a marital setup is because a husband deals with his wife just like he would deal with a friend who's male and vice versa you know they don't understand that they have their needs and their needs are different to each other The other key thing to appreciate when we look at the whole concept of how to uh, strengthen love between uh, the husband and wife is to appreciate that at the end of the day words matter you know what we say ultimately sometimes injures certain people and really hurts certain people what we do in the household matter for example how we help and conduct ourselves our relationship sometimes certain wives or husbands have a very important relationship with their families so if we don't respect that relationship and try to somehow even if we may not get along then we are hurting our partners our spouses in that regard mm. but ultimately it comes down to a very key factor and that is to know that love is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placing it in our hearts which he has promised in the Quran ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحبة this mm. جعل means I have placed amongst you amongst your hearts love and compassion but it will strengthen over time people can't expect at the beginning of marriage when they're head over heels of each other they think oh the more I'm married the more I'm drifting apart that's a problem that means they're not working on their marriage they're not investing in their marriage they're not understanding and seeking help and tools out there that are needed to see okay what is wrong what am i not doing what advice can i get from people who are experts or scholars or people out there who are dealing with challenges okay let me know just like how i feel spiritually empty maybe i'm not doing the right thing to enhance my marital relationship so mm. seek advice develop an understanding of these wonderful relationships and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless their marriage Ahsan that was uh, some really wonderful uh, advice and i hope that uh, all our viewers uh, can learn from it and take it on board in their own marriages uh, you are watching this show where we are celebrating uh, the uh, lessons of the life of Fatima Zahra alayhi and commemorating uh, sad demise uh, do join us for the next episode where we shall be examining the injustices done uh, to this great lady inshallah inshallah we'll see you then wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh